What's up everyone? Today I'm showing you how to analyze and explain the rhetorical situation of a passage for the Rhetorical Analysis Essay, or Q2, of the AP English Language and Composition exam. We'll be using an actual passage that was featured in the 2020 online AP exam, and I'll put the link to that passage in the description box below for you to check out. The rhetorical situation is basically the who, what, where, when, why, and how of the passage, and it's a key part of the College Board's rubric. Every rhetorical choice that you find in a passage will somehow tie back to the situation, and the rhetorical situation is composed of six different parts. First is the author or the speaker. What is the personal background of the author or speaker, and what is their viewpoint or perspective? Next is the context, or the time and place in which this passage is occurring, and that will definitely differ depending on whether the text is a letter, a speech, or any different type of piece. And the context includes the historical, religious, economic, pol and political conditions that are occurring in the time in which the passage was written. Exigence is the author or speaker's motivation for making the text, or the driving force behind the creation of this piece. Next is the audience. Who exactly is the author or speaker addressing, and what are the characteristics of the listeners or readers? Do they have some sort of shared identity that binds them together? We also have message, or the central argument or topic of the text, and everything else in the rhetorical situation ties back to the message in some way. And lastly is purpose, or the author or speaker's intended effect on the audience. This could be anything ranging from persuading, urging, honoring, informing, any sort of powerful verb that encapsulates what exactly the speaker or author wants to accomplish in the passage. Now let's take a look at one of the passages that was included in the 2020 online AP exam. This is a 1985 tribute speech by President Ronald Reagan, and there's this description that's across the top. It's not taken directly from the College Board, it's actually taken directly from the John F. Kennedy Presidential Library and Museum's website. I'll put a link to that in the description below. But if we read this description of the speech at the top, you'll probably get something similar on the AP exam. And we can learn a lot about the rhetorical situation just through this small description. We can see that the context in which this passage is occurring is the fact that Reagan is speaking at a fundraiser at the home of Senator Ted Kennedy in Virginia. And Ted Kennedy or Senator Edward Kennedy is the brother of President John F. Kennedy. Also, we can learn more about the purpose of this passage, which is to lend support to create an endowment for the Kennedy Presidential Library. So President Reagan is definitely going to be throwing his support behind this endeavor throughout the entire passage. And of course, we know that the speaker is President Ronald Reagan. In the very first paragraph of this passage, we can immediately notice the exigence, which is the fact that the Kennedy children, or Caroline and John Kennedy, specifically asked President Reagan for their support in helping the library. So that is the driving force behind this speech. The Kennedy children's request is what has inspired President Reagan to speak on their behalf today. And also we can learn more about the message of President Reagan's speech when he says that a good deal of truth resides in a strikingly sculpted library that contains the accumulated documents, recollections, diaries, and oral histories of the New Frontier. And the New Frontier actually refers to this progressive policy platform that President Kennedy advocated. And the message that we can learn about through this small excerpt is the importance of a library that preserves the history of JFK. By describing this library in very positive terms, President Reagan is trying to persuade his audience that this library definitely needs to be funded. He also refers to his overarching purpose, which is to honor the legacy and character of JFK, when he specifically starts to describe 
the man, the inner personality of President John F. Kennedy. He says that he's a man of the most interesting contradictions, very American contradictions. And he actually uses antithesis to describe these contradictions in a parallel fashion later on. Another important element of the purpose of this speech is to illustrate JFK's personality with a bit of humor when President Reagan says he could cuss a blue streak, but then he'd been a sailor. And by using humor, President Reagan, the speaker, is actually endearing himself to the Kennedy family because members of the family are actually sitting in the audience. In this highlighted portion, you can see that President Reagan is discussing the fact that President Kennedy loved mankind as it was in spite of its imperfections. And this is a part of President Reagan's overall message, which is that an effective leader acknowledges the flaws of themselves and mankind. So whenever you see a thematic statement that is conveying a universal idea, this is usually a clue that the speaker is trying to talk about a larger message. So make sure to look for those kind of statements whenever you're reading a passage. In this highlighted excerpt, President Reagan talks about the fact that the U.S. had real adversaries during JFK's presidency, but JFK always tried to be strong, keep the defense system unsurpassed, and keep the country safe. So this is a reference to the context of, the JF of JFK's presidency because President Kennedy prioritized defense and international relations during events such as the Cold War. And this had a direct impact on the speaker himself because President Reagan's own actions during the Cold War and other events were influenced by JFK's own actions. So we can see here that President Reagan is talking about someone who influenced him directly, who probably inspired him in his own decision making. And President Reagan is talking directly to his audience of Americans in this sentence when he says, he, or Kennedy, was a patriot who summoned patriotism from the heart of a sated country. So President Reagan is making this appeal to patriotism through this discussion about civic duty especially when he makes a direct reference to one of President Kennedy's most famous quotes, which is, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. We can learn more about the speaker himself when President Reagan explains that he was a Republican who did not support JFK when he ran for president against then Vice President Richard Nixon, but President Reagan still respected JFK as a leader. And this is a testament to the fact that President Kennedy's leadership was admired by people of diverse political ideologies. And in this highlighted excerpt, President Reagan is directly addressing the context of this passage because he still remembers the aftermath of JFK's death over 20 years later. He actually uses an analogy to compare President Kennedy's death to a comet disappearing over the continent. And this imagery, along with the smaller anecdotes about the ways in which individual people around the world grieved after Kennedy's death, prove how important it is that this presidential library is funded. This library is needed to preserve the memory of JFK so that he is not forgotten. And in this last paragraph, President Reagan again returns to a larger message, which is that JFK was a symbol of the nation of the United States due to his values and his own contradictions. Actually, three paragraphs earlier, President Reagan mentions that JFK was fiercely partisan, but at the end of the day, he always put his country over party lines, and that was one of many contradictions in his personality. But that's also a contradiction that can be seen in the United States as a whole. Here, President Reagan directly addresses an audience of younger generations of Americans when he states that he wants to talk to those who are still in school and who sometimes think that history is a dry thing that lives in a book. 
And when he states that nothing is ever lost in that great house, he's referring to the White House. And this idea that music plays on is actually a metaphor for history and how history never dies. It's this overall message that historical events directly impact today's world, so history must be preserved in some way. Again, going back to the overall purpose of establishing and funding this library. And this next paragraph is really interesting because President Reagan describes this legend that you can hear past presidents in the White House, such as President Franklin Delano Roosevelt and others. His purpose is to evoke nostalgia through the imagery of living memories in the White House. And when he describes the sound of piano music and a bright young president, that's a reference to a memory of President John F. Kennedy himself. And it's also an example of an emotional appeal that definitely tugs at the audience's heartstrings and makes them realize how important it is to preserve President Kennedy's memory. At the very end of this passage, President Reagan again mentions the fact that members of the Kennedy family are in the audience when he says that Nancy, or President uh, Reagan's wife, First Lady Nancy Reagan, and I salute you, Caroline and John Kennedy, in your efforts. And he also reverts back to the larger purpose, which is to pay tribute to President John F. Kennedy and support the endowment. So including that final mention of the endowment is really powerful here because it reminds the audience why they're there. They're here at this fundraiser to support the funding of this library, perhaps make contributions themselves. And President Reagan wants to make sure that his audience knows directly what they have to do after listening to the speech. Thanks for watching. Let me know in the comments down below if you analyzed any other different aspects of the rhetorical situation or give examples of rhetorical choices you found in this passage and how they relate back to the rhetorical situation. Remember to like, subscribe, and tap the bell, and I'll see you next time.